the production possibilities curve. We need to answer the four questions and use the factors of production in order to determine the fair, efficient allocation of scarce resources among competing and unlimited wants. Now, we know things have a cost, and we could also assume that things have a value. If you pay the cost, that's the value you place on it. The value of a product, however, is different for you than it is for me. The workings between cost and value for each individual is done primarily to increase their own wealth, and wealth is defined as the moving of assets from lower to higher valued uses. It's very subjective and different for each person who comes across it. In economics, the answer to the what question is partly answered by a concept called the production possibilities curve. This basically means that the output of production throughout the economy reaches its limit at a certain place. And beyond this place, there be dragons. I mean, beyond this place, you cannot produce. The production possibilities curve assumes three things. That there is sufficient available resources. There's enough stuff to make everything we want. There's fixed technology. We have the tech available to utilize those resources in such a way that they will make what we want. And there's full employment. Everybody who wants to work is working well, within a small percentage. Some people aren't working. Some people aren't looking for work, so they're not counted in unemployment figures. Uh, the homeless, the disabled, full-time students, they're also not counted in employment figures. So everybody who wants a job has a job within maybe 3 or 5%. The production possibilities curve is not a fixed point. It's more of a range of options and opportunities. This blue line is the production possibilities frontier. Beyond this place, we cannot currently produce. Now, when we are producing at max efficiency, we are at anywhere on the curve, B, C, or D. When we're producing inefficiently, we're not using all of the technology resources that we have, we are at position A. And right now, given the technological and other resources we have, it is impossible for us to produce at point X. Now, the production possibilities frontier is not a fixed measurement. Over time, and with the discovery of new resources, developments of new technologies, and additions to the labor market, the PPC can expand. When the PPC expands due an increase in any of the three considerations, there can be more of everything. The production possibilities frontier can also contract. War, disaster, mass casualty events, the Rona, all can reduce the number of resources that we have in order to create stuff. In economics, the classic example that every economics studies is the concept of guns and butter. The vertical line represents the possible production of butter in the United States, and the horizontal line is the amount of guns. The question is, how much guns and how much butter? We need to allocate resources and we need to direct the factors of production in a certain direction. The Smith & Wesson factory cannot produce butter and dairy farms aren't really in the useful in the manufacturing of 357s. So we need to answer the question, what will be produced? The more guns we produce, the less butter will be produced. Now the consideration of who comes into play. Who will benefit by making guns and who will benefit by making butter? Certainly we need to eat, but we also need to maintain security against our enemies, foreign and domestic, don't we? Looking at the world in 1983, we had a need, some might argue, for more guns than butter. Looking at the world now, we see that we don't have any real big enemies, but we have a bunch of little ones. To put it another way, you can either read or you can work. You cannot do both within your current personal production possibilities curve. If you exclusively read, you won't have time to work at all. If you work all the time, you will have no time to read. But if you read some and work some and play some, you'll be underutilizing your production possibilities. So what you need to do is you need to figure out the costs and place value on all of your decisions. Can you expand your PPC? Yes, you can. Can your PPC contract? 
It sure can. Back to guns and butter. Now, there is not an even trade-off. For every movement along the frontier, there's a loss of productivity. This cost has to be taken into account when we determine the what. And the reason that there's a loss in productivity is because we've got to retrofit the dairy farm in order to make the block. We need to retrofit the Smith & Wesson in order to make heavy cream. Now, of course, the best of both worlds in terms of guns and butter, there are some terms that I need you to know. Money. Money is whatever we say it is. Money is a commonly accepted medium of exchange. Little colored pieces of paper are money in the context of the game Monopoly. It has value and can be used to buy goods and services. At Disney resorts, Disney dollars are worth face value. But you can't go and spend a Disney dollar down at the local 7-Eleven. However, there are some stores in Anaheim and in Orlando that will take Disney dollars as currency because they know that it's real easy just to pop over to the Disney lot and trade in the cash for American money. This is a hundred trillion dollar note from the Bank of Zimbabwe. I've got one of these. I am a 100 trillionaire in Zimbabwe if this were still money. Back in Zimbabwe in 2008, the economy was in such bad shape that there was such inflation that they had to print a $100 trillion note. These were taken out of circulation, and I bought mine on eBay for 10 bucks. <laughs> Barter is the exchanging of goods and services without using money as a middle means. The butcher and the fisherman set their values based on what they perceive it to be. Again, this is rational self-interest at work. The butcher feels that this ham hock is worth the fish that the fisherman is going to give him. If there's an imbalance, there will be no trade. In Monopoly, when you land on Boardwalk and have no cash, you have to trade in a property for your stay. The property is not money as such, but it has value both in real and opportunity costs. If you have the only property that's going to keep the other person from making their own monopoly, then maybe that value is greater than just the regular price tag on the monopoly board. Fallacy of composition. What's good for some is not necessarily good for everybody. If a few do it, it may be beneficial. If everybody does it, there's no game. The last Dodger game I was able to go to, I saw this picture. Now, the woman in blue is having a hard time seeing. So what she did is she stood up. As soon as she stood up, she had a better view. But when the play was made, Kobe decided to stand up, and now she has a blocked view. What was good for her is not good when everybody does it. A post hoc fallacy. This is the confusion between things that happen at the same time, coincidence, and things that happen because of something else, cause and effect. For instance, Chuck Norris was born on May 6, 1945. On May 7, 1945, Germany surrendered in World War II. Now, what's the difference between micro versus macroeconomics? Microeconomics is the choices made by consumers, firms, and how those decisions affect a market for a particular good. Macroeconomics is a 30,000-foot view of a nation or a global economy as a whole. Last thing I want to talk to you about is this little triangle. In economics, we use the symbol triangle to indicate there's been a change in something. Now, when you see percent triangle, that means that we are indicating a percentage change as opposed to a raw number change. You are going to be seeing this crop up throughout the course.